Check one, two. Here we go. Justin's doing a great job. Youth group's growing. And if you have youth or you know of youth, invite them. We have youth here on Wednesday nights and on Sunday morning during the, I think it's after worship. Is that right? Yeah. yeah after worship up at the Middleburg campus, we have youth also. So they're gathering together, having a great time, getting filled with all these spirit, baptized. It's an amazing thing. Hey, open your Bibles, if you could, to Luke chapter 10. I may stick a little closer to my notes today because this is not the message I'd prepared. I got up this morning and boom, that's, I was a little late to church actually because I was feverishly taking notes, you know. It, uh, I realized there was a, a, a series of things that happened this week that God was communicating to me that I, I, I got and I missed. You know, sometimes you get the revelation and you miss the application. <laughs> but I, I think I got the application, so I just want to share it with you today. And I've been, of course, talking about your, your supernatural life map for the past six or seven weeks. We've got one more week in that next week. And then I'm heading off to Germany for a short time. I come back. Graham Cook's going to be here, and we're going to kind of move, shift a little bit into a different uh, focus for the fall. But uh, this has been a map really about discovering ways to align yourself and prepare yourself uh, both of those are very important in order for the purposes of God to emerge in your life. You know, this is a life of intention that we live. It's a life of uh, Jesus saying, learn of me, come follow me, take up your cross and follow me. me. My yoke is easy, my burden. There's, there's a learning process. And that's important right now because in some charismatic circles, of which we are, uh, there's this abandonment, abandonment of, of really learning. They're, we've become very experiential, which I have no problem with. Cindy was talking about the dynamic of what happened in that basement on Blueberry Hill. I remember that clearly. And she's been kind of an out-of-the-box person ever since then. You know, it's God, when God touches you, it's an amazing moment. And it can, it can literally transform the rest of your life. That's why we're so big on encounters here really believe that if you wander off, you get involved in legalism, which is like the worst, you know, where you begin to think it's all about works and all about something other than the sweet love of Jesus Christ. You, you venture off into legalism, an encounter will pull you back to the love of God. Or you venture, venture off into licentiousness, what the Bible calls licentiousness, which is a license to sin. <laughs> How would you like to have that? <laughs> a license to sin. And people get that, you know, because of the grace message, they think, well, that means I can live any way I want, and they must not have read Scripture, because that's not what grace is about. Grace is a power to overcome sin. Grace is a, is a gift of the Lord, an empowerment of God to say no to the stuff that you, your flesh wants to say yes to. And so you live in the middle on this love line between legalism and licentiousness. As long as you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, amazing things are going to emerge in your life over your lifetime. And you know, I know it's popular right now to talk about our dreams. I've done that for decades. And, and there's nothing wrong with having dreams. I've got dreams of my own. But there is something too about exchanging some of your dreams or all of your dreams for the Lord's dream. You know, we have this word that's been hanging over our head now for 20 years in a good way. And it's called The City of God's Dreams by Graham Cook. Graham Cook gave this word in 1998 while he was here about what he was going to do in the city of Cleveland. By the way, which much of that has happened. And because that has happened, it encourages me about the rest of it. But here's the deal. This is kind of lost in the whole kerfuffle of this word, which, by the way, is spread across denominational lines throughout this city. I've been to... I've been to black Baptist churches where they speak of the prophetic word of the city of God's dreams. Uh, you know, and they, they even know that it happened here at this church. And it was great. some of them knew it was Graham Cook who's coming in about, I don't know, two weeks now, something like two weeks. But it was a very powerful, life-setting word that came out. In fact, we had two that year, John Paul Jackson and Graham Cook, who prophesied major words about us and about our families and so forth. So we're living those out. But the interesting thing about that word is I've reread it now hundreds of times because uh, it, it's, a, it's a word to me, it's a word to our church and a word to our city. And uh, I realized a few years back, something just kind of gets lost in the, in the history of it. But it really, it mentions that, you know, God's going to do great things in the city. But here's what he really prophesied. He prophesied that this, that the church of God's dreams 
would emerge in this city. In other words, it's not just the city of God's dreams, that's an awesome thing, but the church of God's dreams, in other words, the church that Jesus thinks about, <laughs> the church that warms his heart, the church that is the kind of church that leans its head upon his chest, hears his heartbeat. He said, through the prophetic word, which we agreed with at the time, we said, like Mary, we said, be it done unto us according to your word. That word came forth in such a powerful way that we, em we embraced it and said, Lord, may that be so. Make it so, Lord. Bring forth the church of God's dream. I believe that you are a part of the fruit of the church of God's dreams in this area. Now, you may say, well, I don't really feel like it a whole lot today. <laughs> well, go up to Middleburg. I think they had Donut Sunday today. Maybe that'll help you out, you know. But, there's, but you, you are entering in a prophecy that I believe is from the Lord. In the same way that Cornelius, without even knowing it, entered into a prophecy of Jesus Christ some nine or ten years earlier before he was powerfully touched in Acts chapter 10. Where Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. And he was a part of the uttermost parts. He was a Gentile, a, a Roman centurion. So it took nine or ten years for Jesus in heaven. He's dreaming. He's looking at his new church like, come on, guys. Get it together. Do not get stuck in Jerusalem. But they did. They got stuck in Jerusalem for about nine or ten years. They had a little foray out into Samaria, but it kind of pulled back. Philip went over there and did some things, you know but they quickly came back. They were starting to branch out into the prophecy of Jesus. So here we are. Graham Cook's coming again in a couple weeks. He'll be speaking actually on Sunday morning. Uh, is that two weeks from today, isn't it? Two weeks from today. So I, I'm just praying. I want you to pray too that God will give him a, a, a fresh word, a recap on what he's doing for us, give us marching orders or whatever. So I think a lot about what Jesus thinks. And you know, I, I taught last week. I left here a little bit disappointed, not in you, Disappointed me a little bit. I'm not sure I properly conveyed what I was wanting to convey. But I wanted to convey that, that we are created in the image of God, which means that, you know, I don't know how to explain it. That's probably why I had trouble last week. But what we feel at times is what God feels, particularly on all the righteous side of it. It is not by accident. He created you in his image to have feelings, to have dreams, to have intention, to have love, to, be, to have compassion. All those things are, are mixed in it. So I've been on a track to discover the personality of Jesus and the personality of God. I've been teaching on this for years in, in training type seminars, but not so much on Sunday morning. I'm a, uh, a, a kind of certified instructor for the DISC profile. DISC profile is a personality profile. I just use it myself. I, mean, I used to do a lot of teaching on it way back decades ago, you know. I, I was just fascinated with human personality and diversity of it. And by the way, the biggest thing you're ever going to get out of a personality profile or personality assessment, the biggest thing you're ever going to get out of it is that everybody is different. That's your takeaway. I mean, you're going to learn a lot about yourself and it's helpful and you're like, oh, wow, yeah, that sounds just like me. Or you think, that doesn't sound like me. And your wife goes, oh, no, it is you. I mean, there's there's those moments, you know, with personality profiles, and I like them. They're important. They're not perfect, but they do give you a broad stroke indication of, of where you are and what you're like and your propensities and things like that, you know. So I love studying that, and I, you know, I've always been a DI and the uh, disc profile, which means I'm kind of direct, you know, I'm direct, but I'm also, I love being a, you know, uh, influencer type. That's the I. Um, I'm lower on the uh, S scale. In fact, it's my lowest, actually, which is that kind of one-on-one -on -one social interaction with people. And so when I found that out, I was, I was shocked. <laughs> Not really, but anyway, I was, you know, I was surprised. And I thought, you know, so, okay, we, you know, we, we, cry, we thank the Lord for our strengths, but we cry out for our weaknesses. Lord, you know, strengthen my way. So it's been, a, it's been a lifetime thing. Lord, help me be present. Help me engage. You know, so they're, they're helpful in that. My C was like three. Those are like the... Uh, quality control people, you know, to make sure everything stays together and stays right. Uh, that's really not me. That's why I try to hire C's. So we've hired a lot of C's and S's. I married one. I married a CS, actually, which really fulfilled my entire personality. <laughs> you make us, put us together as one, we're just like Jesus. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> so anyway, I've been talking about Jesus and uh, studying his personality. And it, it just came to me this week. I, I woke up one morning 
uh, this, I mean, it, I want to say it doesn't happen often, but it seems to actually. Uh, I wake up in, in the early morning in, in my bed, the Lord speaks to me. And he did David too, so I'm encouraged by, by that. You know, he says, on my bed, in my head, he heard from the Lord. I mean, there's this, there's this sense that sometimes when you're at rest, there's an openness for the Lord to speak. And so many times, particularly in a recent couple years, actually for about five years since I had stem cell transplant because I spent so much time in bed uh, during that time that I, I, my world shrunk to me and God and my wife who was by my bedside and I just learned a whole new level of communing with the Lord. And so now I lay in bed in the morning and I just, you know, I think what my pastor growing up used to say, I'd rather be here than the best hospital in town. You know, so it's that my, my understanding is I thank you, Lord, that I'm here, that I'm alive, that I can hear your voice. So I wake up the other morning and the word came to me that I knew was from, from him. I knew what it, what, what it meant. I just didn't know the application of it. And that's what I was talking about earlier. And the word was conflate, conflate. Now we know the word inflate a lot in inflation. You know, hopefully we don't learn that word too much over the next few years, but we know inflation. Uh, but there's a conflation also. There's a conflating where there's a pulling together. Inflation is a bubbling up or a blowing up. Conflating is a pulling together and a uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a blending of things, particularly two or more, but particularly two things coming together is conflating. You can conflate ideas. You conflate groups of people. And so that came to me, and it's been swirling around in my head, and I, uh, I just thought, okay, what, what does that really mean for what we're learning right now? And then I realized it, it applies in a very general fashion to what I've been communicating, particularly over the past couple weeks. And that is that God has called us uh, between heaven and earth. He's called us with this supernatural mandate to bring heaven to earth, to be purveyors of the kingdom of God, to be distributors of the kingdom of God. Jesus said when he sent these 70 out, he told them to preach the kingdom of God. So he told them to go out, spread this thing around, tell everyone, because the kingdom is really all about the king. You wouldn't have a kingdom without a king. And so the king is his personality, his desires, his intentions. Let me tell you, for the past years, I don't know how long this has been, maybe for hundreds of years, maybe even millennia, I don't know. But there's been, there's been perversions of how God is and what he thinks. We put God into certain boxes there by putting us into even smaller boxes. You know, I love what Tommy Tenney said years ago. He said, uh, the, the last time, what was it, the, uh, oh, the last time we put God in a box, if man touched it, he was struck dead. That was the Ark of the Covenant. God is out of the box. God does not fit in our little theological boxes. And so the constructs of what we develop for our own personal theology is shifting rapidly. I remember back, back in the early uh, uh, mid-80s, I would say, the vineyard movement, of which I was a key part of back in the uh, early 90s, later on, but I was influenced by the vineyard as far back as 1984, really 1978, but we'll call it 84. 84, when I really started going after John Wimber and his, his thinking, and it was so revolutionary, and they brought music into the church that was so Jesus-focused, and it was right on top of the Jesus movement. So people were learning to be intimate with God, to sing songs of his goodness, and what they found out is when they did that, there was a release of transformation in their lives and a release of power for healing. There's something about acknowledging God and who he is that is the most powerful worship that you can ever bring forth. Forget the lights, forget the music, forget everything else. If you focus in on the Lord and describe who he is and adore him for that, something's going to open up big time in your life. I do it all the time. I just thank you, Lord, for being who you are. I love your personality. I love you, Lord, because you're unpredictable. I love you, Lord, because you always are out for my good. I love you, Lord, that even when you're sarcastic, and he is, I can prove it in Scripture, Whenever you're sarcastic, somehow I know what you really mean. And it, and it warms my heart because you're a dad and you love me and you're dear to me. And I can, 
I can, in Hebrews, you know, it says in Hebrews that you can go in, you can go boldly into the most holy place, the places that priests have not been in. You can go boldly because your dad's in there and you can go and jump on his lap, so to speak. I don't want to get too ooey gooey with this. It's just, I'm a man. It's not my personality. But anyway, you get in, you can get close to the Lord. I mean, I was in there studying this morning and my little grandson who popped by, oh, he's a year and four months old or five months old, something like that, uh, Maxwell. Somehow he wandered into my office, which is in my home. He came in there with his arms up like this. You know, I know, I know the routine. I picked him up, sat him on my lap. He looked at me, looked around the room. He can't really talk yet. He looked around the room with like, so this is where you hang out. So yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? I, I get that. So he came in boldly. You know, anyone else that'd say, hey, I'm studying right now. Grandkids, yeah. they can come in and out freely. Sometimes some anointing on grandkids, you know. So he comes in. It's the same way with us. You can go boldly into the office of the Lord. <laughs> he turns around and says, come on up here. Let's, what's your day doing? What's going on with you? Let's walk together in the cool of the day. That is the heart of the Lord. You get onto a, an adventure of discovering Jesus and who he is and what he's really like, not what religious people tell you, not even what you've heard in the past, but reading a fresh, I would I'd tell you if, you, if you don't know where to go in the Bible right now, read the red print. Open the Bible, read the Gospels over and over again. Get the personality of Jesus Christ. It will transform your personality. So thinking of that, turn with me to Luke 10, because I want to just look at that quickly, and we'll see where we're going from there. But uh, when these worlds begin to blend, like I've been teaching about, heaven and earth, that is a conflation. It's a conflating. When I woke up and heard that this week, I felt like the Lord's saying, this is what I felt. He didn't directly say this to me, but it was an impression deeply in my heart that we're on the right track. Help people conflate the kingdom of heaven with the kingdom of earth, the city of God with the city of man. Help them understand it's not my life and then my life in God, but I daily am walking in a, it's, it's like a, a parallel coinciding life that is on you. You live in two dimensions of reality. You live in the reality of paying bills and working, but you also live in another reality where the giving of your finances opens heaven to pour blessing upon you. I mean, that's two very different realities. You live in the reality of having some crazy man that's in the cubicle next to yours at work or down the line on the, in, on the line that you're in or in the Starbucks that you work with. There's always, there are, there's always one or two crazy people that you get to work with. Not in my case, by the way, but in other cases, <laughs> Jake is actually very solid, you know, but I'm the crazy one. <laughs> so there's always someone like that, you know, and, and, and you, you, in that midst of that difficulty or that challenge, you are learning how to love your enemies you are learning how, and, and maybe this person's not an enemy, but they're just an irritant. It's an irritant, so I've separated myself from them, and so you learn how to love. And those, some people have tried to pray themselves out of jobs that God gave them. Yes. <laughs> that wasn't real popular, but it's true. Yeah, we get put in situations so that we can grow. Yeah. We can develop in God. In Luke chapter 10, there's an interesting part where, where Jesus is ready to send out the 70. And you know I'm going to read a little bit of this. I normally don't read a lot of scripture on Sunday morning. I leave, it's little bite-sized pieces because of time. Obviously, the onus is upon you to go home and go a little deeper or come to our Wednesday night Bible studies or growth groups and get more of it. So Jesus is getting ready to send the 70 out. And we're going to watch for the emotion of Jesus. This is important. Here's, here's what's been in my mind. What makes Jesus really happy and what makes Jesus weep? What makes Jesus ecstatic and what breaks the very heart of Jesus? Because obviously, once I find that out, I'm going to lean in the direction of pleasing God. Now, I know that it's Jesus shed blood that gets me to heaven, but my relationship with God is way beyond just fire insurance. My relationship with God is pleasing my Father. And so I align myself. You know, there's a difference between acceptance and approval. So you have the acceptance of God. He loves you because of his shed blood. But you do not always have his approval. If you have children, you understand what I'm talking about. I love my kids, I accept and I'll do it, but I don't always approve of their behavior. And, and they can probably feel it. Uh, 
in the same way with the Lord, when you're not, you're doing something you know you shouldn't do, you feel that. And some of us say, well, the Bible says there's therefore no condemnation. I rebuke that. Con-. No, that condemnation comes, that shame comes sometimes in our life because it's attached to the sin. It's not God bringing it into your life, but when you separate yourself from the love line into legalism or a license to sin, you are, you are going to immediately begin to feel the backflow of the resistance of sin itself and what it brings with it and the entanglements that are tied to it. And so as soon as you get, it's like you're, you know, my, my new car, I got this Pilot, Honda Pilot, and it has that system that it's, it's for old people. That if you go over the line, you know, on the freeway, the steering wheel vibrates. Any of you have one of those cars? It's kind of the newest thing now. So if I go over the line, it goes like this. And I go, oh, oh, okay, I better wake up. Drive away. And if I go over this line, it goes, and it actually pulls you back. It's almost like a, a, an automatic car, really. It just, uh, it pulls you back in line, you know. And so it's funny, I realize how now I've been drifting so long without anyone reminding me of it except my wife. So she's being replaced now by the that comes out there. And it's the same way. You are in the love line with God. And if you drift over to legalism, Holy Spirit's there like, oh, don't go that way. It's got a reward in it and it's not good. So you go, oh, I better get back in the love. Oh yeah, love line of Jesus. I love this. You go over to licentiousness, you get tempted, you yield to it, starts pulling you back. I want you to know, no matter what you do, there will always be a pull from the Holy Spirit to get you back. Cindy, write that down. It wasn't in my notes. I want to make sure I remember that later on. It's always going to pull you back. It's the love of God that compels you and pulls you. He is, he's always there for you, but you can. You know, the funny thing is, if I, if I override that, if I just turn away from it, it stops vibrating. And I can go into the other lane. I can go off road. I can do whatever I want, but I'm not in the smoothness of the love line of God. So in Luke chapter uh, 10, I know you, you wonder when I'm going to get there. Verse 17 says this. No, that's not where I want to go. Verse 10 says this. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others. So Jesus is expanding his vision right now. He had the 12, and you had, he's had large crowds show up of people. And Jesus loves to, he's got this rhythm where he goes to the mountain, which probably something I should teach on sometime, but he goes to the mountain. He comes down to the crowds. He feeds them, ministers to them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And then he raises up a team and sends them out. So that's the rhythm of the Lord. And then he goes back to the garden or the mountain. And then he comes down from the mountain, ministers to multitude, heals the sick, all the Jesus stuff. And then he works on building the infrastructure for the future. Uh, you are Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. So now he's expanding it. He's sending out 70. And it says here, uh, he appointed them, 70 others, and sent them out two by two. There's so much in this, I, I just don't have time. He appointed them, by the way, he didn't elect them. But anyway, he sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. What a commission. I love the idea that you get to go out where he's gonna come. You know, you go out and you, you're, you're a forerunner. You're a trailblazer. You're opening the door saying, hey, behold the Lamb of God. <laughs> Jesus is getting ready to come. This afternoon after we have a party for my daughter Lauren, it's her birthday this past week, I get in my uh, car, I drive south to Tip City near Dayton, and we're ministering in a uh, gathering down there called the Marked Ones. If you know anyone down there, invite them over to it. And the whole purpose of the Marked Ones, we're stirring revival in the state of Ohio. I think this is our... Uh, fourth gathering, something like that. Maybe it's our fourth. Joel's hev heavily involved in it. But we're going down there. We're doing the same thing. We're, we're, it's infrastructure management. It's saying, do this. Take the kingdom of God. Don't just work a job. Don't just have a marriage. Don't just kind of do stuff. Do it for the kingdom of God. You still get to do the same stuff, but it's going to change your whole life. You're going to see everything totally different because of your approach to what you're doing. Your career is a God-ordained position, a role, and even a place, a location where you can express the goodness of God. A marriage, even if it's a difficult marriage, is a place you can express un unrelenting love and forgiveness and compassion and long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit will birth in you even in a difficult marriage. 
So we go on here. I told you I could get sidelined on this. But anyway, it says here in, in verse, uh, where was it? Verse 2. It says everywhere he's about to go, verse 2. Then he said to them, the harvest is great. And labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of harvest to send out labors into his harvest. Now, I want to skip down to verse 17 because Jesus is concerned. Je you feel the heart of Jesus. This stuff Jesus is talking about. He's saying, pray, folks. <laughs> I mean, if Jesus says pray, I mean, you, if Jesus is in the room, you think, why do we need to pray? Apparently, Jesus thought you needed to. So we do that. Sometimes I don't even ask questions. I just, he's Lord. He's boss. Let's put that in contemporary words. He's boss of my life. And so if he says do this, there must be a good reason for it. So he says pray that the laborers will come in. I pray that for Brunswick. I pray for Middleburg Heights. Lord, in Akron, Lord, send the laborers in. Now jump down to verse 17 because Jesus gives them all kinds of coaching between verse 11 and verse 17 that you can read later. It doesn't relate to what I want to share right now. But here's what happens. So they go out and they blow it up. Man, they are learning what the power. I mean, it's, it's their first time out kind of on their own, these 70, two by two. And by the way, most of these 70, <clears throat> if you follow them in church tradition, they end up all over the world. You know, it, the Bible doesn't get into all that. Church tradition does. Reliable texts throughout tradition. They went to, man, they went to India. They went to Africa. They went to Europe. They went all over the place, these 70, because they could go somewhere and say, I was commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a huge weight back then. And they moved in supernatural power. This is their debut deal, man. And they come back saying, woo! It was awesome. It's like when you get on the ministry team here at Bethel Cleveland, you know, yeah. The first time you prayed, someone was sharing a story as they came in, Kevin McNeely, about Wednesday night. People, people are being healed on Wednesday night. Stuff's happening. Someone's leg grew out and stopped at the length of the other leg, which is really good. It's like the leg grew out, you know? And uh, it, was, it was a powerful thing. And everyone's like, woo! I mean, it's an exciting time. And God's doing stuff. When you do that, Kevin McNeely, it's old stuff. And he's been doing it for years. But your first time you do that, you're like, whoa. And they go, I'm healed. You go, are you sure? I prayed for you. Yeah, believe it or not, God used, used you. What? Really? It takes a minute. You're in shock. This really works. God really moves in power. God really touches people. It's a powerful thing. So they, they're coming back. You know, let's not be too hard on these 70. I know I've heard a lot of sermons that have been kind of hard on this 70, but when they come back, you can't blame them. I mean, they're, just, they're like kids in a candy store. They're so excited. They realize this heaven to earth stuff like really works. I called heaven down in a situation. They were wanting to call uh, thunder and lightning down. Wrong heaven. Go up a little bit higher, turn left. I mean, it's a, they called the kingdom of God down, and they realized, whoo, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I like this thing called the kingdom of God. So they're all, they're all, they're, they're very excited about it. So verse 17, it says, then the 70 returned with, what they return with? If you're depressed, minister to somebody else. If you're depressed, get in children's ministry. <laughs> They're going to pull the joy out of you. Usher, serve, do something. Get involved in a small group if you're depressed. When you get in there, minister to that ogre at work. You minister to that ogre at work and something's going to happen to them and you're going to go, Woo! your joy is going to come upon you. Your midnight is going to be turned into the midday according to Isaiah 58. So it says this, it says, he says, Lord, they're joyful. They said, Lord, even demons were subject to us in your name. I mean, I'd say the same thing. I'd be, I'd be pumped about it. You know, I'd come back and say, you know, Bill Johnson, you know, he's, he's somebody who's senior in my life. I'd say, Bill, it was amazing. Now, Bill's, you know, very gracious. He'd say, you know, he'd probably say what Jesus says. So that's awesome. That's amazing. It's amazing. But, but don't rejoice in that, he says here in verse 18. He says, I saw uh, Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. This is just from what I know of Jesus. This isn't Jesus giving them a little lesson. Boys, boys, calm down. Can't have this joy stuff. See, that's counter to the, to the very heart and personality of Jesus. So if you dip into it, you realize Jesus is a, isn't sternly looking at them like, oh, have I not told you? 
over and over again. I've given you authority, but you're taking it too far. He doesn't do that. No, so knowing Jesus' personality, you read into this, this is probably how Jesus said this. Jesus was probably like, we know this contextually, and I'll show you in a minute. But Jesus is probably like, whoa, whoa, that's amazing. That's amazing. And he says this, woo, I say to you, I saw, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now see, that could be, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Everybody's like, okay. I thought it was an exciting thing, but maybe it's not. Now, Jesus is more, you got to put this in here. You can insert this because you know Jesus. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So he's not saying that, that they're in the wrong. He's saying, I love these things. This is conflation. Yeah, yeah. This is when things come together. This is a thing that excites Jesus. It excites Jesus when you do stuff. <laughs> It excites Jesus when you insert yourself into a difficult situation and it's turned into the garden of the Lord. That excites Jesus, you know. And so he's, 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 doing, he's recognizing that conflation and he's even speaking here and he said, behold, I gave you authority to trample on serpents and scorpion over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. Woo! And I, I feel like, you know, in scripture, I almost feel like we should have a pause there, like a selah in the Old Testament. Selah, selah. It's a pause for appreciation. It'd be like, whoo They were probably just like, whoo Let's just worship for a minute, all right? And Jesus says, nevertheless, uh-oh. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. In other words, he's not saying never rejoice in this, obviously, because that's not uh, uh, in sync with who the personality of Jesus is from what we read throughout all Scripture. You can't just pull one verse out and say, aha. You gotta look at the general personality and very character of Christ and what he does. So you know that he's still in a joyful mode with them because you rejoice with those who rejoice. You mourn with those who mourn. So Jesus is rejoicing with them. He says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that your spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. <laughs> yeah. I read this, you know, when I read this the other day, I immediately thought of bowling. Yeah, bowling. This is the way my mind works. We went bowling with the worship teams this week. Oh, there was probably 30 of us. It wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> Particularly on my lane. <laughs> it was so much fun, though. You know, it's those, I haven't been to bowling alley in a while, and I forgot that, hey, you don't have to keep score anymore. <laughs> That's how long it's been. You know, the paper and the score, what'd you get? You know, write it down, all that, you know, kind of stuff. And little, little notes for, you know, the turkey and the the strike and the gutter ball. And, you know, you got you to have it all down. Well, now, you know, a computer does all that. So you just eat pizza and talk, talk with your friends and then you get up in the lane and you do your best. And uh, Nate was probably the most unusual bowler I've ever seen in my life. Nate, who runs our soundboard back there, is one of our worship guys, but he did a good job. His ball kind of, he was like a, a home run hitter. His ball either went in the gutter or he got a strike. It was like, it was that extreme with a few in the middle. So, I mean, the ball would go right over and kind of dance on the edge of the gutter and then turn in severely, turn in right to the head pin and boom, and the, the pins would just go wild up there, you know. I could, never, I could never mimic it. My bowling is my bowling, you know. So I get up there and I'm watching everybody. As I'm watching them, though, I'm observing a pattern. And so you, you get up there, you do your best, you get serious, you know, you look, you're, you're circumspect. You look around at other bowlers, make sure that you're not interfering with them. You know, there's kind of, there's a rhythm on the alley. There's a little unspoken rule that you don't run when the person next to you runs next to you. You do not approach the lane. You get ready, you get in your position, you get all ready to go. And then you, you move toward rolling that ball as best as you can. And you know where you want it to go. But it doesn't always go there. And so you, things happen. You know, you get gutter ball. You, you get depressed. Uh, gutter ball. You, 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 might, you might get one pin down. You, I mean, it, it, it kind of either excites you or discourages you in one way. And here's what happened. When they finished that, they would see it and they would celebrate or mourn in one way or another. And then they'd go back and you would stand and everything's up on the scoreboard. So you look up on this, this electronic scoreboard and it's got your, your name is written up there. <laughs> Steve. Wow. My name is written up there. Everybody see my name? 
It's got my score up there for everyone to see. Wow, that shows you how we just love one another regardless, you know. It's up there. It's up there. And then, you know, like it doesn't condemn you. Bad shot, try again. I mean, it's not that kind of scoreboard. In fact, it's an old guy, apparently, because at the end of the game, an old guy climbs a mountain and put a, puts a, uh, uh, a flag in the ground, which is kind of a congratulations of success, which I really like that, you know. But anyway, I'm watching it up there, and, I'm, and what it does is it immediately coaches you on your next shot. So it shows the ball going down the lane, and it's hitting where you need to hit, and you're like, all right, thank you, Lord. And you get back in there and you do your best, you know. And I thought about that rhythm. It's the rhythm of life. You come out, you're doing what you can, but you're going back and you're, you're getting an understanding from a God who loves you that you can, he's coaching you. He's the God of helper. He's, he's moving you toward your next shot. That's the rhythm of heaven. And so these disciples, these 70 disciples, they're coming back. Jesus is coaching them. He's coached them before they go out. There's this sense like, this is amazing. We're seeing the aspect of heaven, the conflation of heaven on earth. It's becoming as one like it does in so many things in our life. If you learn another language, you learn how to conflate. You are blending together. In fact, I'm told that when you learn another language, you know you've learned it well when you start dreaming in that tongue. Amen. Start dreaming in French or dreaming in Spanish. You, you got it out. So what's happened? There's been conflation. The two worlds have come together. When you get married, this is probably the obvious one in Scripture, there's the, there's the conflating of two people into one that you will cling to one another and you shall become one flesh. What that means is if you're not married yet, that you're going to meet somebody and live with somebody who's from a different world. And your life assignment, if you decide to accept it, too late. You already decided to accept it. When you said, I do, I will. So you, you accept that. It's, the, it's a lifetime conflating of two worlds into one. Yeah. And it's not easy, particularly in the earlier years. I mean, I'm sure many women wake up on third or fourth day out, and they're like, who in the world did I marry? What was I thinking, you know? But you're in there, you're bound by a vow, so you say, well, we're going to work this thing out. You begin to exercise the kingdom principles, the love of God, and boom, you bring something together, and there's nothing better than a, a sweet marriage that's been together for 25, 35, 40, 50 years. I read one on the internet the other day, 70 years, 70 years. They were both in their, their mid-90s, you know, and there they were sitting next to each other and just showing loving affection to one another. It's a powerful thing. There's, there's, a, there's a, uh, a something pleasing about it. And so when you look at this, you think, well, this, this is a good thing. Let me just finish because I've just got a few minutes uh, left here. Verse 21 is one of the most mysteriously enjoyable verses that I've read in Scripture. It's probably in the top 10, I should say. But it's very powerful. And it says this, because of the Greek, and I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but in the Greek, well, let's read in the English. In the English, it's in that hour, so in other words, there's a, Jesus is being overwhelmed by what just happened. You know, Cindy talked about Blueberry Hill and the impact that came upon her and she was set free. I turned over to, to uh, what's your name? Jake. Yeah, Jake. I turned over to Jake. <laughs> I said, I said, I had an eight in my head somewhere right there. I turned over to Jake and I said, do you think Jesus had God moments? He said, what do you mean? I said, do you think Jesus had times when he was overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit? We said, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, isn't that kind of an interesting thought? Would Jesus be like, whoa, 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 thin place. I'm feeling the presence of God. Vortex, wormhole. I'm being taken to another place. I mean, did he feel that way? Apparently he did. In his human side, he felt the closeness of God. I know he felt the separation of God. On the cross, my God, my God, why has that forsaken me? I mean, he pled with the Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass. He's feeling the separation from God. But in this moment, he's feeling like, whoo, God is here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm here too. Jesus, God is like, this is a moment where God is just kind of making himself known and spreading out in a way. It's the peanut butter on the bread. It's amazing. It's just spreading out so thick here. He says this, 
For Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. I I love this because King James always dumbs these things down. (laughs) That's why I don't really read it much anymore. But it says, you know, King James says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. See, I don't see that at all. You got to get the whole context. There's been a lot of joy in this hour. I mean, they're going around high-fiving one another, 70 of them, about what was your story? They're sharing stories back and forth. Jesus is watching this. Jesus is seeing uh, conflation. He's seeing, the, he's saying, wow, heaven is coming to earth. I'm seeing it. These guys, this thing may actually work, called the church. And he says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced. You know what it says in the Greek? It says he jumped up and spun around erratically. That's a little bit different, isn't it? Imagine the King James people, what are we going to do with this verse? It distorts our view of God. (laughs) No, God needs to distort your view of God. So what they did, they dumbed it down. He rejoiced greatly. He rejoiced greatly. I mean, don't you think that really helped a lot of people? It said he jumped up and danced like a wild man. That's that's something that it's exciting. You know, Jesus wept also. You know, in... I'm I'm out of time, but if you look at why Jesus weeps, you'll learn a lot about his personality. You know why he weeps? It's always about separation. He weeps two times that I know of, particularly in the the New Testament. He weeps because of Lazarus and his death and Mary and Martha's Martha's, uh, somewhat conflicts that occurred over what was really important and and where was Jesus and all these kinds of things. They had issues. And Jesus wept because he was feeling the dividing of friendship, the separation from a close friend. That's what I believe. And, and I know there's many theories out there why did he weep, but it was a big part where he wept. The other time that he wept, in fact, in that passage it says Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. But the other time is when he was coming into Jerusalem, realizing that Jerusalem was not going to receive the kingdom of heaven at that time. And so there's separation. And so he prophesies over the city and says, basically, you have no idea what's about to come. But within the next 30 years, he didn't say 30 years, but it's pretty much guaranteed that that was in 70 AD. He said, one stone will not be left unturned in this city. In other words, destruction was coming because you did not understand the time of your visitation. So what distresses God in his personality is separation. Uh, A a loss of uh, inflation rather than conflation. Uh, anytime there's something that, that puzzles or disturbs you, the Lord weeps with you. And so you see that. But also on the other side, the thing that he rejoices at, as much as I can find through Scripture, is when people get it. When people get it and then do it and they see it happen. He rejoices wildly before the Lord. Unlike anything else in his life, he jumps up, dances around. I thank you, Lord. This, <laughs> this verse has always been puzzling to me because it's kind of, Tongue in cheek almost. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to these guys. <laughs> now think about that. You imagine that him praying that out loud and the guys are like, hey, yeah, yeah. wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what? Never mind. <laughs> you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Verse 23, then he turned to his disciples and said privately, in other words, how did that happen? He's talking, and he's praying in a public way, and he turns to the guys, come over here a minute. A little confab over here, you know, let's get together and just chat for a few seconds. He says this, he said, guys, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. In other words, he's reinforcing again what they saw. For I tell you, that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. Let's all stand together if we could. Whoa. Let's do what makes Jesus happy. (laughs) You know. I mean, seriously, even that, this is our Sunday for uh, growth groups, right? I mean, 
get in a growth group. It's, it, from what I can understand in Scripture, particularly in the book of Acts, it's what God would want you to do. Because this isn't just about your family, your jobs, your future. It's about your spiritual life in God and the ability to live in a world that is spiritual and natural. I love the fact that ritual is hidden in the word spiritual. <laughs> spiritual is a, is a place of constant, abiding pursuit of the Lord. It's a place that has quiet time with the Lord. It's a place that studies scripture because they realize like Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the world, the longest chapter in the world. It all speaks about the power of the word of God. Go home and read it. It'll take you a few hours to read it. You're just like, yeah, yeah, I need to get myself to the word. It's, it's fellowship. First John talks about the love of God, but the love for those you're with. It talks about also having fellowship with the Lord. Fellowship the Lord is tied in with fellowship with one another. There's a communal aspect of God. And when you do, when you get together in someone else's house, you may not like the color of their curtains. You may think that their dog's a little weird. But you go there and you say, somehow I'm entering into something that's good for me. And I'm going to receive from this. I can tell you what's happening in heaven. Jesus smiles over your desire to do what he's called you to do. Let's just bow our heads before the Lord for a minute. Jake.